Minecraft has been popular for such a long time. It's honestly insane. According to my good friend Wikipedia, it is easily the best-selling game of all time. There was a period of time where the cool gamer Shadow the Hedgehog boys of the internet had reduced Minecraft to that game that's just for kids. But it seems they only really have space for one game to hold that title at a time, and now that's Fortnite. And as far as I can tell, Minecraft is more popular than ever. Have you seen Dream's YouTube channel? Anyway, it's 2020. If you want to create Minecraft content online, you need to zag on it. There are some great tools inside Minecraft to capture your builds or create cinematics, but I have something for you today that will give you unbelievable creative control over how you present your Minecraft creation. Here's some of the things you can create. And that is honestly just scratching the surface. So let's get started. This is all possible because of this free utility, Mineways. Mineways is a free program that you can download. A link will be in the description to their website. And with this program, you can load up any world saved locally on your system, select a part of the map and save that as a 3D model. This 3D model you can open in almost any 3D software, or you could also choose to 3D print that model to bring your Minecraft creations into the real world. When you download Mineways, you'll have this folder open up and you see the entire contents of this program you can double click mine ways to open that right up. Then you can move to file, open world, and here you'll have a layout of the worlds saved locally on your computer. For this video, I have downloaded a world from the mythical sausage, a Minecraft YouTuber, a link to his channel, and this specific video in particular will be in the description. This first world here, tutorial world, is his map. So I'll click that and then you'll see he has a whole bunch of builds right in a line right here. And you can left click on the map to move around, use the mouse wheel to zoom in and out. And all you have to do is choose a part of whatever map you're in that you want to export. When you found your location, you wanna hold the right mouse button to draw a bounding box around your subject. And then most of the time you will get this pop-up. This will give you a rough selection of the height and depth of your subject. So I'm gonna click OK, and you'll see that it is set my default height and default depth. And if I were to pull up my height, you would see at a certain point that pink outline we have completely goes away. And if I pull this down, you'll see at about, what, 14, 15, um, you see that pink. And that is because the selection has reached the roof of this building. And if we pull that back down, we'll get to ground layer and we just need to go a block or two beneath the ground. And then just the way I think I like to pull down height until it gets to about to that roof level and just pull it up so that it is restricting the export. This probably isn't very necessary. If there isn't any actual buildings above the building, it should increase your file size. But then you just go to file and export for rendering. Next, you need to choose a place to export and a custom name. Click enter or save. And then you'll have this main model export dialog. This dialog is very powerful. I've just begun sort of tearing it apart and seeing what the main functionality is. But for this video, we're only gonna change one thing. And that is to uncheck this export separate types box. This will be on by default. And what this will do is it will create separate 3D objects for each group of textures in your scene. This does theoretically give you a little more control, but by unchecking it, it will export our entire scene with one texture and it will make the nodes in Fusion when we get there very clean and easy to work with. Although you do have other options all the way up to exporting individual fully textured blocks. So I'm just gonna click OK and you'll see a quick status bar on the bottom and then we can open Resolve. I'm here in Resolve on the edit page. I have my composition and I'm going to open the effects library, come down to effects fusion composition and drag that onto my timeline. I'm gonna drag out this duration a little bit so we have some more time to work with. And then with this selected, I'm going to open the fusion page. And now you'll be in fusion page and the only node you should have is this one media out node. I'm gonna drag it over here to the right side and then I'm going to go to fusion, import, FBX scene. Then we can navigate to the place we saved this 3D model, select this first file. It will be right next to this MTL file. We don't want that. Select this first file, click open, and then it'll get this other prompt infusion, but you can just click okay. And you might need to zoom out a little bit, but then you'll see it has imported this chain of nodes. 
And really quick, if I go to this last transform node and pull it up in a viewer, you'll see it'll start you very close up. But if you pull back, you'll see that it has imported this entire structure and the area around it as a 3D model inside Fusion. This is already super cool. And there are just a few housekeeping things we need to address before we can really get creative. The first is to build out a 3D scene that this model can actually live in. I'm gonna go ahead and delete this transform. It creates it by default, but I've never really needed it. And coming out of this main model node, I'm going to create a 3D merge. I'm gonna create a 3D render, pipe that to my media out. And in that 3D merge, I'm going to make a camera. And then we can preview that 3D merge as our main workspace. And then just so we have something to preview, I'm gonna pull this camera up with its transform controls. So it's right in front of the house and adjust it so it's facing the house. And now if I pull up my media out, you'll see it is using this camera. It is quite zoomed in. So we are looking right at the front side of this house. So if I select the camera, I come down to focal length. I'm gonna change that from 13 millimeters to 18. And that's a little better. We don't have to go quite so far away, but I'll pull this back. And you'll see now the preview of this render out is this camera that we are moving around the 3D workspace. And if I were to jump back to the edit page, you would see that media out is what is coming back to our edit page. The other small housekeeping thing we need to do is to address an issue with texturing. If I move this camera really close to just this wood on the roof, if I move too close to it, you'll see that it doesn't really seem like the quality is as high as it should be. And that is because of the scaling on the texture. Minecraft, as you know, has this sort of low poly texture look. So the textures that are automatically imported with this 3D model are low texture, but they're meant to be scaled up in a certain way. And by default, the program isn't handling it in the intended way, so we need to change that. And to change that, the first thing we're gonna do is go to our renderer 3D and change the renderer type to OpenGL Render. You'll see it changed the look of this glass texture really a bit, but it hasn't really changed this wood texture. And that's because there's one more step. We need to go to this first MC material node, drop down texture filtering, and on OpenGL High Q, we need to change this from bilinear to nearest. And watch this wood texture when I do that. It instantly looks better. It's scaling in the correct way and giving you this full Minecraft resolution. Then I'll pull this camera back out and give us a nice general look at this model. And now things get really exciting because we have access to all the powerful 3D tools inside Fusion that can interact and change with this Minecraft model. You can add 3D particles or text or lighting. So let's look at lighting because that's very important. In this merge 3D node, I'm going to add a spotlight and by default, it will appear at that same default location where our camera did. So I'm gonna pull that up and position this, move around my camera just so it's over in this corner and rotate this so it's facing our building. And right now you'll see nothing is changing and that's because in our render 3D, we need to go in and check on lighting. And and it goes black because my light is pointed in the wrong way. So I'm gonna position this back. And as I move this towards the house, you'll see that when I get this lined up correctly, this spotlight is actually shining this light right onto our house. And this is pretty extreme. So one thing I like to do is add an ambient light into my scene as well. That way our spotlights can be more for texture or use more creatively, but we have this ambient light piping in as well. And then we can crank that up so that none of our shadows get too dark. It provides a nice uh, general illumination. And in our renderer three, we will just check on shadows as well. And this will cast shadows on itself and that will look really good. And even just with lighting, this is something you could play around with for a really long time, get all sorts of really creative looks. Real quick, I'm just going to drag this spotlight sort of up to the side, this general look. I'm gonna make this a little warmer. I made the light a little off-white and you'll see that is reflected on all the colors in the scene. But then I'm gonna add one more spotlight and we're gonna get a little wilder with this one. I'm gonna pull it up in my 3D scene. This one is going to aim at the light from the other side. So I'll come down here. And in this light controls, I'm actually gonna pull down this cone angle. So it is very much a spotlight. You'll see I overshot our house a little bit, so I'll bring that back. And as we move this, you'll see it start to affect this scene. But this I'm going to really push. I'm gonna make it this sort of vibrant 
aqua maybe yeah and you'll see it does some really interesting things this is even shining inside the house a little bit but this is all functioning like a real light wood. This is a real 3D environment that you can mess around with. And of course you have full controls and full keyframe controls over all of these. You could keyframe this light to sweep across your scene and interact. And it looks, it looks pretty cool. So to finish showing off this on a very basic level, I'm gonna set up a simple animation. That is just gonna be this model rotating so we get a full look at it. One way you could do this is to take the camera and actually keyframe or set it on a path so the camera moves around the model. But because the model is self-contained, we can actually just rotate that and leave our camera stationary so you see the entire thing. And the way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna go into this last default node. This is our main model. All the nodes before it are the texture but I'm gonna go into transform. And at zero frames, I'm gonna set a keyframe on this Y rotation. Then I'm going to go to my last frame and I'm gonna change this to 360. In my viewer, nothing will change. But if I hop around my timeline, you'll see that the entire model actually rotates. This, you, this, you have a great representation of this in a 3D scene, how it's rotating in correlation to these lights it's rotating you see this entire model until it gets back to center and because the lights are tied into the 3d merge after the fact the lights are always in the same position in regards to the camera and that is just how this node system works if after this default i were to add a merge 3d node and move all of my lights from this second merge to this first merge and then let's go back to this default and to actually undo these keyframes. If I were to go to this first merge and keyframe the transform for the merge, that would transform the entire 3D scene connected to that merge. You'll see if I just scrub this Y in this 3D viewer, you'll see that those lights are also now pivoting with the model. So let me do that. I'm gonna set a keyframe of zero on that rotation at zero frames, go to the end of my timeline, change that to 360. And now if I scrub, you'll see the camera does that same rotation movement, but the lights, which you'll see in this 3D viewer as well, stay in relation to the model and not the camera. So you get consistent lighting as you rotate around your subject. And now I only have one final thing to show you, and I consider this the secret sauce to getting your renders looking really good. And that is ambient occlusion. So to demonstrate this, first I'm going to go ahead and just undo these keyframes. It'll be easy enough to set those back up later if I want to. I'm gonna take my camera and I'm going to push it into my scene a little bit. And I'm actually gonna move this so that I can take a look at our roof because I think this will be a really great example of what I'm talking about. Move it up, rotate the out. So now we have the look of this scene. I'll scale up a bit and I'm actually gonna change so that I only have this one viewer. And this does look pretty good, especially with that light casting those shadows, looks pretty good. But we're going to add ambient occlusion. Ambient occlusion is a little technical. You see it in lots of 3D work. So let me try to explain it. It's similar to contact shadows. When two things come together or are near each other or when things to come to a corner, ambient occlusion darkens those areas. And this can give renders a really nice, pleasing, natural look. So let's build it out. And to get this set up, the first thing I'm going to do is go into my renderer 3D node and in output channels, pull that down and you have to turn on Z and normal. Then we can create an ambient occlusion node. Just leave that sitting out here. And going into this, we're gonna take the output of our renderer 3D and the output of our camera. And if we preview that ambient occlusion, you'll see that at those intersections or where multiple models are on top of each other, it's adding shadows in those areas. For instance, right behind these lamps, it's quite a bit darker because you have the walls coming together and the lamp. And there are just a few things we need to set up so that this can actually interact with our scene. The first is to create a bitmap node. If we pipe the ambient occlusion into this, if we preview that, it will be all white and we need to change this channel to luminance. And that will look again similar, but because this background is now black, what this is actually doing is creating a mask. And on this mask, the white layers are solid and the black layers are transparent, but we actually want that to be inverted. So in our bitmap controls, I'm gonna click this little invert box and this is actually what we want. So the last node we're gonna add 
is a brightness and contrast node. And we are gonna add this coming out of the other output of this render 3D node to our media out. I'm gonna add this, it won't affect our scene right now. But if we drag the bitmap out onto this brightness, it will use that bitmap, that mask, to control what areas of the image this brightness and contrast actually affects. So we have this mask, the white areas are where this brightness node will affect. So watch our image as I pull down this gamma, especially in these brighter areas of our mask. If I pull this down, you'll see that it adds those shadows. Under this roof, even inside the bushes, it starts to look pretty good. So on this merge, I'm just going to rotate by hand a little bit, get over to the other side of this house. And if I toggle on this side, it's even more apparent. It has much softer light on this side of the house. So when I toggle on and off, you see all those shadows comes up and it looks, it just looks really great. So now I've just got to rebuild that animation and get this onto the edit page. So I'm gonna take my camera. I'll keep it at this little sort of interesting angle, but I will back it up just a bit. And then in this merge node, set a keyframe on frame zero at zero, go to the end, set a keyframe for 360. If we go to the edit page, scrub a little bit, you'll see this animation, and I'm just going to let this cache so we can preview it. All right, our cache is done, and quick word of warning, this could take a while. That took a couple minutes. I'm not on the best system, but be warned, caching and rendering something like this 3D model, depending on how complex your scene is, could take a while. But let's check out what we have. This looks really cool. Because we ended on that 360 rotation, this actually loops pretty seamlessly. I love how all the windows on this build let you look inside as you pivot around and you see uh, sort of the teal light coming through the building. This looks really cool. And I know this is really powerful. And I hope a lot of you are already coming up with cool ideas for how you could modify this effect to show off your creations. Like I said, any number of lights or even 3D text you could track into a scene. There are so many options here and I can't wait to see what you all come up with. Figuring out this whole process has been very fun as well. And I've learned several other tips. So if you're interested in any of that, drop a comment below. I'll likely make a follow up to this video walking through a few more of the customizable options and maybe showing off how you put 3D text in a scene, different camera angles, all that sort of thing. Um, I know this is really powerful and I know there's a lot more that I personally want to dive in with this tool. But for today, that's all I have for you. So thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please drop a like. If you have any crazy Minecraft worlds that you've built with a friend, share this video with them and maybe you all can download your world and see what you all come up with. And to make sure you don't miss out on any of my future tutorials, consider subscribing. Thanks, I'll see you next time.